Wild Israel takes you to the most isolated place in the country, the Negev Desert. Discover a world few have ever seen, where only the toughest can survive the brutal heat and deadly cold. Learn the survival secrets of the hunters and the hunted as they struggle through a year in the Negev. In Israel, history is everywhere. Religion and cultures have intersected over the centuries, but the country is less known for its fascinating wildlife and terrain. Explore in Israel most people never see. From snowy peaks to the world's lowest sea. From Mediterranean beaches to lush waterfalls. And from colorful coral reefs to green mountains ancient desert landscapes. And one of the most incredible places of all is a part of the country where survival is a real challenge. Spanning an area about the size of the state of Connecticut, the Negev Desert envelops the southern half of Israel. While there are some towns, villages, and nomadic tribes, the Negev is not densely populated by humans. However, wildlife is everywhere. Government laws protect these animals from being hunted, but they still have to protect themselves from each other and from the desert itself defying a barren landscape, freezing winters and searing summers. Constantly on the prowl for food and water, their survival is little short of a miracle. What are their secrets? How have they adapted to the Negev? Welcome to one year in the life of this remote and magical region. Summer in the Negev brings extreme conditions. Temperatures can rise to 113 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and drop to 50 degrees Fahrenheit at night. To learn more about this secret battleground, rangers from the Nature and Parks Authority have installed cameras throughout the region. Their photos reveal a startling world rarely seen by outsiders, especially when so many are active only at night. The Arabian wolf is one of the smallest wolves in the world, evolved to survive the Negev. Its thin, wiry frame requires fewer calories. Its large ears help release body heat. In the summer, its fur grows short. They are more active at night when the Negev cools down. This minimizes their loss of body fluids. And because food is so scarce, these wolves need to live in small, more sustainable packs. This family has dug its burrow on the Jordanian side of the border. Every night, the parents leave their cubs and roam in search of food, ignoring minefields and barbed wire, crossing the border into the Negev. With enough luck and skill, wolves can take down a desert hare, birds, even a Dorcas gazelle. But a large proportion of their food is comprised of the carcasses of domestic animals, fruit and vegetables from hothouses and fields.
and they have learnt the art of disguise. Wolves will cover themselves in the pungent smell of carcasses. This trick hides their predator smell. After a successful night, wolves bury any excess food for the difficult days ahead. While adults hunt, the cubs stay close to the den's entrance. They spend the long waiting hours at play, developing the skills they will need as desert hunters. Tonight, they practice hunting insects. Adult partners enjoy a warm and close relationship. They rub and caress and maintain constant physical contact. Their relationship lasts for many years. Every night, the pack declares its presence with a symphony of calls. After an active night, the pack's territory is marked again with urine. Each member of the pack adds his individual urine mark to the boundary. Before the sun rises, the wolves disappear into their dens, making the struggle for survival a little easier for other animals. This family of porcupines lives in burrows that are about six feet deep. They sleep during the day, but when darkness falls, they set out to dig for plant corms and bulbs that provide food and water. At 37 pounds, this is the biggest rodent in all Asia. Porcupines rely on their sharp spines to fend off predators. Surviving another night in the Negev, the porcupines take shelter in their burrows to hide away for one more day. At the peak of Mount Negev, this is Mahtesh Ramon. It's a vast crater that measures 25 miles long and 1,600 feet deep. In summertime, the temperature can reach 113 degrees Fahrenheit. In winter, it can plummet to minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. The Maktesh is a valley surrounded by cliffs. Weathering and erosion have exposed the ancient rock layers, revealing colorful sandstone cliffs, volcanic hills, and wide channels. Yet, even here, these cliffs and channels teem with wildlife. Three different species of hedgehog inhabit the Negev desert. They spend the cool nights and early morning hours hunting insects, scorpions, and even snakes. And each has made it to Israel from a different continent. Originating in Asia, the long-eared hedgehog is like a living radar station, able to pick up minute vibrations made by tiny creatures crawling through the sand. Sometimes, the struggle for survival does not involve a predator or the terrain. Here, two long-eared hedgehogs fight for ownership of the burrow. Each extra minute in the scorching sun may cost them dearly, and the only important thing now is to escape to the cool burrow. The desert hedgehog, originating from Africa, is well adapted to the deadly Negev. Its long legs create distance from the hot soil and enable it to run long distances with surprising speed. In the summer, it is active at night and avoids the daytime heat. 
During the cold winter, it hibernates underground and emerges in the spring. The common hedgehog that originates in Europe also lives in the Negev. The female hedgehog nurses and rears her cubs in a weedy burrow. They're born about the same size as a walnut, blind and already spiny. Fortunately for their mother, the spines are still soft at birth. Within a few days, their eyes open and their spines harden. Within six weeks, they will have to venture out by themselves into the desert and face all the dangers lying in wait. Another creature caught in the struggle for survival is the fat sand rat. Sand rats dig their burrows among the roots of a large salt bush. It's now the peak of summer and water is scarce. It manages to survive only with the fluids in the salt bush leaves and feeding on the bush itself. Each rat has a territory that includes a network of underground burrows and scattered salt bushes above ground. The rat is diurnal, eating in the early morning. When full, it gathers salt bush leaves and takes them down to its burrow. It needs to roam across its territory gathering food without becoming food itself for predators like this falcon. It hovers mid-air waiting to dive. But this time the little rodent escapes into his protected burrow. Only during the mating season do two partners meet. After mating, the male returns to his burrow, leaving the female to rear the cubs alone. Native to Israel, the caracal is deadly enough to command the top of the food chain. Like a sophisticated hunting machine, the female caracal sets out, slowly stalking her prey. She catches a large rodent in the sandy channel. But the search for food in the desert is never ending. In the afternoon, she ambushes birds that come to drink water. The hunt is successful, and once she is full, the female caracal calls her kitten, who patiently waits in a rocky hideout. The kitten is threatened by birds of prey and other predators throughout his childhood. His mother will keep him alive until it's his turn to make his way alone. The pool of water is a hub of activity when the hunters depart. And now the hunted can dare to take their place. These are chukars and sand partridges. Once they are sure that danger has passed, they approach, camouflaged like desert stones. Families of chukars and sand partridges cannot afford to linger here. The risks are too great. The chukar chicks are led by their father, even though they are almost the same size. Sand partridges teach their chicks where to find the rare water sources in the desert. But surviving in the desert is not only a matter of finding water, food, or shelter. It also means staying and fighting back together. In the Negev, some smaller animals have developed communal defense strategies. 
nestling in acacia trees. The Arabian babblers live in small flocks where an interesting dynamic comes into play. A leader who wants to consolidate his status does not threaten or impose his dominance by force. Instead, he helps and provides for the entire flock. For instance, he volunteers to stand guard from a high branch, exposing himself to danger. Using sharp shrieks, he warns of approaching predators. Thanks to him, the entire flock managed to escape to the acacia thicket. The leader displays his strength and courage by feeding others. And the female? She seems to prefer him over other males who invest less in the group. Only the dominant pair breathes. Thus, the bird which makes the greatest contributions to the community is more likely to have offspring. The turquoise-colored eggs must be incubated and covered at all times to hide them from predators. All group members pitch in, protecting and caring for the offspring, which are not theirs. This community has fixed rituals. At sunrise, they conduct a morning dance that demonstrates their bond. They squeeze between each other and clean feathers in a ceremony of closeness and connection. Volunteering for the community is particularly noticeable at times of danger. A Palestine saw-scaled viper threatens the babbler's area. All members of the group surround the poisonous snake and the dominant babblers attack it, even if it means risking their own lives. The viper is particularly dangerous for small birds like babblers because it is active during both night and day. This time, the babblers win the battle, but they're not always so lucky. The ability to fly is their greatest defense. For some other animals, being grounded does not automatically mean a death sentence. Out here in the Negev, the animals active during the daytime need to be able to escape their predators and endure the punishing heat. The Negev is home to herds of Dorcas and Acacia gazelles. These animals can reach speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. Their survival here lies, in part, with these acacia trees. The acacia's sweet flowers and seed pods provide an important dietary supplement. Each morning, the gazelle feeds on flowers that fell during the night. The Dorcas gazelle obtains all the fluids it needs from the leaves. Light-footed and fast, the gazelle is well adapted to the wide desert plains. Its sand-colored coat provides essential camouflage at times, it almost seems to vanish into thin air. In the past, large herds lived here. Proof of this lies in ancient hunting structures known as desert kites. The kites are built from two low stone walls that forced the animals to run into a trap. A desert kite was always located in a strategic position on the herd's foraging route. In a hunting attack, the frightened gazelles run the length of the stone walls straight into the trap, a deep pit. Researchers digging around desert kites have also found animal bones much larger than gazelles, such as the Asiatic wild ass, a member of the horse family to this day still untamed by humans.
The wild ass can weigh up to 440 pounds. Sustaining that kind of weight in the desert heat requires it to drink every day, and this compels it to travel huge spans in order to find watering holes. The wild ass has an increased sweating mechanism, and during the daytime heat it climbs the mountain peaks where winds help to cool its wet body. In the afternoon, wild ass from throughout the Negev highlands gather at the water hold, camouflaged and almost unseen. Females with foals, young males, and strong territorial males that come alone. All converge cautiously, fearing to approach the water, a hunting ground for predators. The gathering at the waterhole provides an opportunity to measure social status and to find a mate. A young wild ass becomes aggressive to confirm his status in the group. Another begins a wild, insistent chase after a female. If she's not in heat, she will keep running until he gives up. The females do not usually accept quarters at the crowded water hole. They prefer mating in the open landscape with the dominant male who is scared off the competition. The pregnancy lasts 11 months, and the foal stays with its mother for an entire year. Relationships within a herd are not permanent or long-term, and the herd membership changes constantly. But there is still affection and intimacy here. This adult female has a collar as part of a research study. Until 1927, Asiatic wild ass lived throughout Middle Eastern deserts. However, due to extensive hunting, they currently face worldwide extinction. In 1968, 11 Asiatic wild ass, originally from Iran and Turkmenistan, were brought to become a contained breeding nucleus in the Negev. The breeding nucleus was highly successful and generated a large wild ass population. A few dozen were released into the wild, survived, bred, and became this large herd, numbering some 250 Asiatic wild ass. The sky fills with autumn clouds, but there's no guarantee the rains will come soon. The animals face a constant battle to endure and prevail. They've seen no rain for the last 12 months. And so does the varied plant life. These Sternbergia and meadow saffron flower early. They are perennials, feeding from their bulbs or corms, food storage organs below ground. This allows them to survive where other plants would die. But these plants are still desperate for rain. Luckily, this year the rain arrives just in time. The entire desert sighs with relief. But within a few hours, so much rain falls, the desert soil cannot absorb it all. Layers of clay prevent the rain from seeping in deep. The soil is sealed after just a few drops. Now the water accumulates quickly and begins to wash away the foam of the arid loose soil.
This is the best time in the desert. Everybody is happy. Among these rocks hides a small plant with unique survival skills, Asteriscus hirachunticus. This plant covers its seeds right after flowering. Only a strong rain can soften the special covering that opens up to the water. The seeds can wait and survive for years for a rain heavy enough to wake them from their slumber. When the Asterico seeds germinate, little yellow flowers appear next to the dry mother plant. Fall and winter are very short in the Negev desert. For two months, the area experiences rain and floods, sometimes snow high in the mountains. But these short seasons are crucial as they provide desert life with essential water in the hotter seasons to come. And then the season of renewal. In a rain-soaked Negev, Spring can bloom suddenly, throwing the desert into a brief celebration of colors and smells. The period of bounty is very short. The desert animals seize every moment. The plants hurry to complete their life cycles before the summer heat. They flower in a spectacular range of colors inviting insects that, in return, pollinate them. Red tulips adorn the mountains, taking in the morning dew, their bulbs buried deep in the rock crevices where the water supply lasts longer. On the peaks of the Negev Highlands grows the desert rhubarb, producing leaves that reach three feet in diameter. The rhubarb is called the self-watering plant. Each raindrop falling on its enormous leaf is channeled down to the root system, providing it with 16 times more water than all the rain splashing around it. So this broadleaf plant can survive in the desert, enjoying growing conditions typical of a wet climate. The temperature starts rising. The soil starts to lose its moisture. In the river valleys of the Negev Highlands grow magnificent Atlantic pistachio trees hundreds of years old. Their roots sink deep into the soil to reach precious water. The tree's appearance changes during the year. In the dry summer, it is green. In autumn, its leaves turn red. And in winter, when the desert turns green, it sheds its leaves and stands bare until the following spring. These ancient trees are a relic from a colder and wetter bygone era. It has survived almost a thousand years because it is considered sacred by Bedouins who never cut it down for fire. Now the desert becomes an oasis, attracting a wide array of bird life, drawn to the short, sudden abundance of greenery and insects. In the spring, the male McQueen's Bustard performs elaborate dancing ceremonies. The female watches the males from her hiding place and chooses her partner for the mating season. Each year, the male returns to the same dancing stage and tries again to impress the females.
This is the rare cream-colored courser. The courser uses this moment of bounty to rear its chicks on the riverbed vegetation. When the summer comes, they will be mature enough to try and survive on their own. The cream-colored courser flies well, but if there is no danger around, it prefers to run. Also fighting for food and space in the Negev is another bird, the Temminck's horned lark. It can move quickly, and when it needs to, freezes in place, blending in with the desert stone. In early summer, the males define and defend their nesting territory, standing and singing on shrubs and stones. And eventually, the females join their chosen mates. Springtime signals a vast northward migration by storks leaving Africa for their nesting areas in Europe and Asia. On their long journey, they pass over the Negev. Most of them hurry by, ignoring the flowering desert. But some stop for a short rest in fields and on mountains, hungrily snapping up insects, reptiles, and rodents. The stork's annual journey is a huge feat. Leaving Germany in the autumn, wintering in Africa, and flying back to Germany. Some are injured on the way. The flock does not wait. Here, a solitary stork is left behind. Its broken leg may prevent it from completing its migration. A tragedy for the stork, a welcome sight for a hungry predator. This family of red foxes is highly dependent on finding the carcasses of these migrating birds. They live in a dune within a multi-branched network of burrows. The red fox is one of four species of foxes that live in the Negev. Thanks to the wet winter and abundant food, all seven cubs have survived so far. They spend their days playing at the den's entrance, running and leaping in the relative coolness. Their games are not just for fun. Learning to make those same leaps will be useful for hunting and mating rituals, all just months away for these cubs. As darkness falls, the mother comes for a quick visit. She's been gone for hours. Her cubs are ravenous. The suckling is quick, and the seven youngsters are no longer satisfied with their milk ration. The cub's hunger sends both parents on nighttime hunting trips. The young still don't leave the den's entrances and wait impatiently for their parents and their food. At first light, the female fox found a fresh carcass of a desert hare left by a pharaoh eagle owl. It's not easy to give up, but the fox is a real threat, and the owl is forced to abandon its catch. 
Its chicks waiting hungrily in the rock will not get this meal. The female fox hurries to the maze of burrows. This morning, all seven of her cubs will go to sleep fed and satisfied. The mother has won another day in the Negev for her young family. She can never know if it will be their last. Spring in the Negev provides a welcome feeding ground for the Nubian ibex. At only a few days old, these kids are already frolicking happily. At first light, the young enjoy friendly horn fights. The young females also join the play fighting. But in the Negev, even during play, the threat of death is ever present. On a nearby cliff, a pair of Benelli's eagles loom dangerously. These eagles are quick enough, strong enough, to steal a young ibex kid. So the young must stay with the herd for the first weeks of life. Not far from the eagles nests a pair of brown-necked ravens. They harass the eagles and annoy them. These parents are distracting the eagles from the chicks in the nest. In the heat of the day, the ibex leads her young kid to the spring. They leap down the cliff steps to the shade and water. Without thinking twice, the mother leaps over the last gap. Kid, this is an unpassable chasm. He doesn't dare leap after her and looks for another way with growing anxiety. If he can't get to his mother, his fate might be sealed. A young solitary ibex kid is easy prey for Bonelli's eagles. And even if he survives the daylight hours, he's no match for the nocturnal predators, hyenas and wolves. There is no other way. His mother calls him from the depths of the canyon. He did it. His leaping and climbing skills will improve within days. In the meantime, he rushes to safety by his mother's side. The rising temperatures and dry water holes drive the ibex to the springs. Ibex require a daily supply of drinking water, and there are few desert springs with a year-round permanent stable water supply. And in the Negev, water can be found in the most unlikely places. Ain Avdat is one of the largest and most important permanent springs. On the ridge near the spring, a magnificent Nabataean city was built over 2,000 years ago. The city of Avdat, whose inhabitants drank from the same spring's waters. 
The water holes and springs are desert lifelines that provide food and shelter for many desert birds. They flock to the water to drink and bathe. Some are native to the Negev, like the hill sparrows, desert finches, and trumpeter finches. Others, like the Namakwa dove, come from Africa. This is the most northern place it lives. Another bird able to survive here is the rock martin. It collects mud from the river channel in its beak and builds its nest in the canyon's crevices, not far from water. The chicks grow in a padded, comfortable mud house. Higher up the cliffs live bigger, tougher neighbors. On the rocky ledges of the Ainovdat cliffs, migrating annually from Africa, is the Egyptian vulture, which shares the Negev cliffs with the griffin vulture, a permanent resident. They glide above the ridges, looking for carrion. Griffin vultures are partners for life. They share incubation of the solitary egg for two months. When the chick hatches, it receives devoted parental care. Even after leaving the nest, it returns to demand food from its parents until the next egg is laid. But there are limits even to motherly love. When this young vulture tries to return to the nest, its mother is too busy caring for a new chick. This young vulture must search for his food alone now, a mission that has become harder in recent years. Development in the Negev has severely harmed griffin vultures. They face extinction due to urban expansion, dwindling open landscapes, and a lack of food. From a population of hundreds, now only a few dozen remain. To support the population that nests in the region, nature reserve rangers have set up a number of feeding stations. Each vulture fights aggressively for its place and its meal. To keep an eye on their battle to survive, most vultures are tagged for research and monitoring. As always, the Negev makes no promises. Every animal lives day to day. Compared to the larger, deadlier vulture, the smaller, humble sand grouse enjoys a far stronger chance of surviving. In the Negev, there are five species of sand grouse. They come to the water at fixed hours, some species immediately after sunrise, others just before sunset. For many years, researchers didn't understand how they nested in the most arid regions devoid of water, or how the chicks survived the terrible drought when their parents fed them only dry seeds. Continuous monitoring solved the amazing riddle. The male sand grouse has a special covering of chest feathers that functions like a sponge. The male flies tens of miles from the nest to a water source and absorbs water in his chest feathers and then flies back to the nest. The chicks poke their beaks into his chest feathers and drink the water as if he was a flying water bottle. Sand grouse are the preferred game bird throughout the Middle East, but in Israel they are fully protected, like all wild animals. Great efforts are made to preserve wildlife in Israel. In 1968, the Nature and Parks Authority created the Yotvata Wildlife Reserve in the Negev. 
a desert center for conserving and nurturing species on the brink of extinction. The wildlife reserve also protects other desert animals from outside Israel, such as the Adax and the Sahara Oryx from Africa. In the open area of the wildlife reserve is a breeding nucleus of Arabian Oryx that lived previously in Israel and Arabia and is currently under threat of worldwide extinction. In the spring, dozens of young Oryx were born. Dr. Ronnie King selects the Oryx that he must tranquilize before the intended release to nature. He shoots the selected Oryx with a tranquilizing arrow. Its horns are sharp and dangerous, and it is treated with due caution. The rangers attach a radio transmitter to the Oryx's neck in order to monitor its integration and acclimation to the free herd in the Negev landscape. The young Oryx are brought to the acclimation pen from where they will be released to nature, join the herd, and run free in the Negev landscape. About a hundred oryx already live and reproduce in the Negev. For the winners in this battleground, summer comes again. The males once again prepare for mating season. An entire year has passed in the Negev. Freezing nights and burning days, scarce food and water, and unforgiving predators. But time and nature do not stop. The young wolves go hunting by themselves. Herds of animals start to roam in search of water. All want to survive another year in the Negev. It is the only home they know. <laughs>